Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. I hope to shed some light on a subject concerning our loved ones uh, who are unsaved that we would like to come to see saved, especially at the time in which we're living. But we have to balance that with the reality that we're saved by grace. Now, if a man by nature always resists the grace of God, then in order for that grace to be effectual, it must in some sense be irresistible. For if the grace of God were ineffectual, then none would be saved, and this we know is not the case. And so that starts to be, at least that begins to give us some comfort in this area of concern. We know by experience that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither indeed can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. On the other hand, we also know that to them that received him gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John chapter 1, verse 12. So, to speak of the grace of God as ir irresistible, which I believe it is, I'm going to suggest that it is, is not to say that man can't resist it, because he does, he does resist it. Uh, it is only to say that human resistance is allowed to proceed so far and no further than God pleases. The Jewish authorities were allowed to resist the Holy Spirit to the very last. Uh, we see that in Acts chapter 7. But Paul was allowed to resist only to a point when his resistance was suddenly brought to an abrupt end on the road to Damascus. The grace of God, dearly beloved, is sovereign. But it cannot be said to be irresistible because men do resist it. And your loved ones, may, you may be witnessing them resisting that. I hope to give you some comfort by the end of this video here. It might be better called efficacious grace rather than irresistible grace since man can resist it. This is really what the saving grace of God is. This would, this would spoil a widely accepted uh, acronym uh, TULIP, you know, that many Calvinists are familiar with uh, uh, and have been for generations. But in the interest of greater doctrinal precision, it might be well to abandon that phrase irresistible grace and call it efficacious. Now, while it is true that man cannot continue to resist the grace of God if the purposes of God require otherwise, there is no doubt that even the elect are sometimes reluctant at first, if not actively hostile, as Paul obviously was. Stephen is a, a testament to that. What does this re resistance signify? What of the man who seems anxious for the Lord's salvation and yet hesitant about accepting it? You know, per perhaps, you know, he's the one that's not far from the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 12, verse 34. Yet, he's procrastinating. He's on the very threshold as though, you know, both longing for and fearing it at, at one and the same time. If the natural man cannot receive these things, how can a man half receive them and half resist them? I mean, is he half dead? Or is it that being born again is a process rather than an event? The question is really an important one to answer, and it may give us some comfort here. Was Paul actually already born again that he could recognize the Lord against, uh, uh, you know, whose pricks he had been kicking so hard, even though he continued to kick? When did the saving grace of God first reach out to Paul? You know, when he began to flee, or only after he was overtaken? Would the truly dead be aware of the pursuing God of love? Or, or was there already a spark of spiritual life that made him aware of the divine pursuit long before the moment of, of capture? Paul must have known of the, the prickings of God, but how did he know? The truly dead know not anything, Ecclesiastes 9.5. Was there then a glimmer of life already engendered? In, in short, when does the process, when does the process of being born again actually begin? 
was not Lazarus made alive while he lay in the darkness of the tomb and before he came forth into the light. Psalm 80 verse 18 and 19 surely sets the sequence of events in their right order. Quicken us and we will call upon your name and we shall be saved. Okay. Note that it's first quickening, then calling upon his name, and finally salvation. So shouldn't we then suppose that the man who kicks against the pricks like Paul or uh, who, who comes from the grave still bound hand and foot with, with the garments of death like Lazarus or, uh, or who has progressed along the way so that he is not far from the kingdom of God like, like the scribe, you know, even though he has not yet been wholly set free to rejoice in the assurance of his salvation is is nevertheless already spiritually alive in some some sense is is he already alive when then really is the spark of life actually introduced now the most apt analogy of all is certainly the analogy of birth it's uh, you've heard me talk about it a lot it's new birth it's uh, born from above it's it's, uh, it is the analogy which is associated uh, inevitably and often with our Lord's conversation with, with people, uh, with Nicodemus in particular, but it's an, an analogy adopted in both the Old and the New Testaments alike. Okay, if you really look, you'll see. Uh, even going back as far as Deuteronomy of the rock who, who begot you, Israel, you are unmindful. Uh, says Deuteronomy 32:18, uh, shall a nation be born at once? Isaiah 66:8. Keep in mind, God elects nations as well as individuals, you know. And then, of course, John chapter one, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Uh, John chapter three, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Uh, James chapter one, verse 18, of his own will. He begat us with the word of truth. How about blessed be the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. That's 1 Peter 1 3. You know, there are many verses on this. Uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. 1 Peter 1.23. Consider what this analogy implies. You know, we customarily, normally, we think of a, of a new birth, the, the, uh, the, you know, the public uh, manifestation of conversion as the starting point of all of our Christian experience. That's, that's where it all began. Yet, is this really... True. Is that really true? Is not birth preceded by a period of covert growth and development which follows the act of union of two seeds at the conception of the individual? Life, folks, begins with conception, not with birth. And perhaps this is where spiritual life really begins. You know, in natural life, uh, a seed is germinated and a period of development is initiated as a consequence and until after a certain number of of days or, or weeks or, or months or, or whatever of this prenatal life, depending on the species, gestation is complete and the new living organism comes forth into the world, like my, well, jalapenos did and my corn didn't. You know, so you're delivered. The newborn becomes an independent source of life. Now, if we transfer these sequences of events to, to spiritual birth, we have to conclude that before actual conversion, like Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, there's probably a gestation period. This gestation period is not fixed in duration as is like in the natural world. I mean, you know, it's like nine months. You know, everybody kind of has nine months to think about this, you know. Your loved one only has nine months. That's, that's not what, you know. Some move quickly from their first introduction to the things of God towards actual conversion. Others move slowly. You know, it may take years. If you've been working on this guy for a long time. You're 
or your your sister, your maybe your mom. I don't you know whoever, but it could take years, could take days, could take minutes. In either case, it's a period of hidden growth, of uneven growth, seemingly of fleeting evidence of life, followed by such stillness that we despair of the individual's viability. Uh, many people pass through this gestation period unevenly, uh, rockily, you know, bumpy, at times eager to learn and to talk and to read the Word of God. They're really interested in what you're saying, and then, well, that changes, you know, at other times showing almost no, no interest at all, total disinterest, you know, and throughout this time, the individual invariably lacks assurance like you know, just like the fetus, he or she is dependent entirely upon the protection and the encouragement and concern of others. There's no genuine spiritual vitality that is truly self-sustaining. But these are our loved ones. And we love them deeply. And we care about them. And we want to see them in heaven. You know, these things are commonly observed by those who are involved in personal evangelism who therefore have opportunity to witness a, a kind of spiritual life which the Lord must have, have seen in the young scribe who was not far from the kingdom. You know, and to witness a, a kind of resistance to the promptings of the Lord, you know, which must have characterized Paul's kicking all the kicking that he did against the pricks before he was finally brought, finally brought to that place of non-resistance. We don't want to make the mistake of mislabeling these individuals, dearly beloved. You know, it could be then that conception and not birth is the initial step taken by God in making effectual the election of one of his children. He says, his word will not return unto him void. You know, it must be taken in secret, hidden from both the individual himself and from those who are observing him. The seed which is germinated in the soul is the implanted Word, the Word of God, and the germination is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not your work. It's not our work. It's God's. Who makes it alive. In due course, after a gestation period, the child of God comes to birth. Sometimes... Quietly, and sometimes dramatically. It just depends upon the person and circumstances and how God designed it. But, you know, perhaps there are false labors, false alarms, even births induced before the proper time. But none of them, folks, are stillborn. Okay? And spiritual conception is an act of God. You know, as John... Uh, 113 says it is not of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God and as the Lord said to Nicodemus that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit John uh, chapter 3 verse 6 it is of his own will that he begat us not of any corruptible seed such as is physical but of an incorruptible seed which is the word of God first Peter 1 23 Okay, germinated by the Holy Spirit in what can be described only as a form of virgin conception. This, this, this process is irresistible because there's no one there to resist. This is, this is a work of God, clearly, holy, of His initiation. And without human consent or refusal, the Lord's people may indeed play a part in it, for it's their privilege to plant the seed, but the, the recipient of life plays no part in the process whatsoever. None. Do we have any in, uh, indications in Scripture at all that such a period of secret development, you know, that's kind of like gestation and initiated by something akin to spiritual conception, that, that that really does precede the actual coming to birth of a soul? Well, I believe we do. I do. I, I believe we do. So let's, let's look at four passages of Scripture, which, just, at least to me, it, it sheds a remarkable light on this matter. Cast your bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. He who observes the wind shall not sow, and he who regards the clouds shall not reap. As thou know not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so you know not the works of God, who makes all 
literally, who is doing the whole thing. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening withhold not your hand. For you know not whether this or that, or whether they both alike shall be good. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. The kingdom of God is such as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knows not how, for the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 and 28. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes and whither it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. John chapter 3. I, Paul, had planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he who plants anything, neither he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he that plants and he who waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now I want you to notice in these quotations the, the recurrence of such words as sowing, seed, wind, womb, born, water, and so on. Folks, the passages clearly reflect, reflect the same pattern. The, the birth of a soul is like the sowing of a seed which germinates in secret by a mysterious process followed by a time of hidden development, which we call gestation. Remember that the seed is the Word of God. For we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God. Of His own will, uh, he begat us with the word of truth, says James. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's Romans chapter 10. The seed is the word of God, Luke chapter 8. You know, in the natural order of everything, the actual infusion of, of individual life does not begin at the time of birth, but at the time of conception, folks. Conscious life begins with birth. What a man may remember with extreme, uh, I mean, Technicolor, you know, is a spiritual birth, but who can recall or whoever detected when the whole wonderful process was actually initiated, folks? Only God knows which seed of the many portions of the Word of God that may have penetrated and lodged in the womb of, of the soul, you know, how it will germinate. Will it germinate? Being fertilized by the Holy Spirit, it is our... It is our privilege, folks, to plant this seed. It is our privilege to water it. But I doubt if this is anything more than a privilege. I, I doubt whether we are any longer absolutely essential because the Word of God in, in printed form has really run to and fro to every direction on earth to every part of the world for men to read. There are many places where it's, it's not yet known and, and, and here it is our responsibility and perhaps we are uh, indeed essential for its planting, but by and large the seed, the seed can be planted now through a printed portion of scripture, a tract, a, a billboard sign, uh, you know, without any personal human attendance. I mean, we know this by experience. Men have been saved by, by reading a newspaper. Men have been saved by reading a, a page blown from a torn New Testament. But it is our privilege to plant the seed and it is our privilege to be there also to assist, if possible, in the prenatal development of the newly conceived yet unborn soul. It's what many Christians seem, tend to long for, tend to desire. Uh, 
You know, most of us have witnessed the entire lack of assurance of, of, of those who are still seeking, but have not yet come to birth. It can be maddening, it can drive a person crazy. They just, they love God, they don't have that assurance. They're dependent upon uh, our constant stimulation or, or encouragement. Men do resist this coming to birth, even as Paul kicked against the pricks of God and, and who has not exclaimed in eager anticipation, you are not far from the kingdom. You know, I mean, how could the dead, those in whom there is no spiritual life what, whatever, how could they possibly kick against something of which they have not the slightest awareness? And how could the dead so act as to give the impression of having gone a long way towards being alive? Such resistance at the time of conversion could mean only that there is already life present and at what time in the cycle of coming to birth could such life have been introduced other than at the time of conception. So, you know, it's, Steve, they just don't meet my expectations, you know. You know, if we ask, well, what kind of life can the spiritually dead soul have before that soul is born again? We can only answer, well, it can, it can have the kind of life that we all have before we are born the first time. For this, only conception is necessary. The germination by the Holy Spirit of, of the seed, which is the Word of God, implanted in the soil of the soul, though the soul is indeed spiritually inert as a seedbed, Yet it has a passive aptitude to nourish that implantation if God sees fit to give it life. At this point in time, there can be no resistance. The implantation and the germination are, are unresisted and irresistible because while man may sow the seed, which is which will the, the ground cannot refuse, only God can germinate it and and ungerminated, it comes to nothing. Here, here then, we have to suppose that the birth of a soul begins with an act in which the recipient plays no part. Here, election becomes effectual. Here, the Lord's atonement is first made act applicable. Here, a new creation in Christ is initiated. In this gestation period of prenatal existence, the real life of a child of God begins. Here is fashioned in secret like the stones of the temple, which were later brought to the site. One more member of the body of Christ, a brother or a sister in the, in the blameless family of God for whom Christ died. And it could be one close to you that you dearly love. There's no resistance to the grace of God in this genesis of the Christian soul, nor in the very nature of the case can there possibly be. It, it all begins with the seed, which is the Word of God, sown through the agency of God's children, germinated and caused to begin its growth in secret through the agency of the Holy Spirit and watered and nourished by the Lord's people. We become co-workers together. We, we become co-workers with God, but we never usurp the creative power which rests only in God's hands. We never do that. Thus, as, as we analyze the, these verses, we see the picture emerging. As the Lord's children and bearers of the seed, we are encouraged to sow wherever there is any hope of a return. Beside all waters, as Isaiah 32, 20 puts it, after many days, the returns will become manifest. Not all the seeds will be germinated, folks. Not all. Indeed, very few of them, probably. Or this seems to be God's way. After how many days? Well, we're, we're not told because different soils and different environments produce different harvests. We are encouraged only to have patience because 
the results will be after many days and not, and not immediately. There, there is no fixed gestation period in spiritual matters like there is in human pregnancy. But the possibility of delay ought not to become an excuse for putting off the sowing. He that keeps his eye constantly on the weather will not sow at all. And whoever spends his time studying the sky rather than the soil will find that he has no harvest to reap. We do not know the way of the Spirit, folks, nor precisely how the seed grows in secret before it demonstrates its viability by bursting through the surface of well, what they call Mother Earth. This is surely the message of Mark chapter 4. We sow faithfully, and then we go about our normal business. By all means, cultivate the ground, water it regularly, but do not try digging up the seed. You know, have patience. It takes time. It is God who is working at it, God who is working it all out, all things according to His good pleasure. Therefore, we just keep sowing in hope. As Isaiah says in chapter 55, Isaiah 55, 11. So here then we have a situation in which it, it's clear that while others cooperate with God in the birth of a soul, that soul does not himself make any contribution at all what, whatsoever in the initiation of life. The soil is dormant, uh, having only a potential, a capacity for life, but there is no active will either to seek or to refuse the spiritual germination. Conception. Could be your loved one. God has conceived. That seed is germinating. Uh, have patience. Uh, hope. There. It's never any reason to, to lose hope, ever. No matter how far they appear to go off the rails, as you might say, or as we would say here in Oklahoma, there's no reason to, uh, to feel that way at all. The creation, the new creation, folks, is a sovereign act of God's grace. It's not derived out of the old will as though the old will were by some uh, process purified in part but it effectively breaks the bondage of the individual to the old will by creating, creating an, an antagonist to it, okay? The new life introduces a new kind of motivation, uh, new desires, new goals, new aspirations. The, the old desires, the old goals, the old aspirations are now challenged. All right, that may be something you want to look for in your loved one. The will to, you know, don't base it on the assurance that they lack. Please don't do that. The will to righteousness is not derived by some corrective process within the old will which gives it powers that it did not have before. The will to righteousness is identified with the creation of the new man in Christ Jesus. You know, conceived as it were, virginally, this new man by the very nature of his being begotten of God partakes of the divine nature. He partakes of the divine nature. You, you and I have partaken of the divine nature. This is what Paul in Romans chapter 7 refers to as the inward man, a, a phrase which, you know, in keeping with the original Greek, uh, uh, might quite properly, you know, be said to be the man, uh, the man inside. You know, it, it, it is only embryonic until it is brought to birth and it is immature immature until it is brought to perfection when god's molding and chastening work is completed we're all at different levels of spiritual growth oh there's every reason to have hope now life comes before faith the gradual change which is observable in the elect before they come to birth is spoken of as repentance. You know, like life, repentance also precedes faith. Faith is exercised by the living, not by the dead. Uh, the, the verse, the text says, clearly says, He who lives and believes, John chapter 11. And as is clear from John chapter 10, we must already be Christ's sheep to be believers. 
The Lord did not say, you, you are not my sheep because you believe not, but you believe not because you are not of my sheep, which is a very different thing. Faith is not the cause of this life, but the proof of it. We are not saved because we believe, dearly beloved, but we believe because we are his sheep. Whenever repentance and faith are spoken of in, in juxtaposition, repentance is placed before faith. Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 21, and Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. But if faith is the result of life, then, then well, where does uh, repentance uh, originate? You know, one can hardly see repentance, uh, uh, even when commonly interpreted as, as sorrow for sins, as occurring before the Spirit has been made alive. Yet we normally think of it as a sort of a kind of a, a precondition, you know, to the new birth. It's not. It's as unpopular as that may sound. But if man is spiritually dead until he's born again, well then how can, how can he fulfill such a precondition as that kind of repentance which seems to require that, he, that he, he be already alive? I mean, does a corpse sorrow over its deadness? I don't think so. Can the spiritually dead sorrow over his sins, except perhaps to regret that they didn't succeed as, as he kind of had hoped that they would? This is what Judas did when he repented himself in vain, Matthew 27. Must there not already be some form of spiritual life within the heart to make godly repentance possible? Otherwise, like Judas, a man merely just, just changes his own mind. Repentance, uh, you know, I, I had a brother here just a day or two ago ask me, well, maybe you could talk about it a little bit, so I am. Repentance in the more basic uh, sense of the word means change of mind, and it's reflected in, in experience as a changed attitude in the unbeliever towards the things of God. The idea of a change of attitude on the Lord's part, which does not involve sorrow for sins, is frequently observed in Scripture as the... as, as uh, well, I could list the verses. There's a number of them. It's also a work of God. Repentance is a work of God. What we often witness in those whom we seek to lead to the Lord before they're born again is just such a, a change of attitude. That's what we want to see. The idea of sorrow for sin is, is by no means always apparent. Often it's rather a new interest in spiritual matters, a new desire to find meaning, a new openness in discussing the things of God. They may be asking you a lot of questions. They may be going about it in a sort of a, you know, secretive way. I don't know. But uh, such new attitudes do not merely appear after, right after conversion. They're often observed before conversion. They seem to be part and parcel of what is meant in Scripture by repentance. They represent the beginning of a genuine change. So... Shouldn't we presume that the seed of spiritual life has already been germinated? Dearly beloved, it was perceived by all the reformers that the free grace of God must be preserved in its purity in the saving process by insisting upon the elimination from it of all the leaven of synergism of man cooperating with God, the idea that it was necessary for new birth. Otherwise, God is robbed of His glory. Man's encouraged to attribute to some power, some act, some initiative of His own, uh, some, some I, initiative of His own is His participation in that salvation which in reality has come to Him from pure grace. Pure grace. To God alone belongs salvation and the whole of salvation. He it is and He alone who works salvation in its whole reach, any intrusion of any human merit or act or disposition or, or power as ground or cause or occasion into the process of divine uh, satisfaction, whether in the way of, of power to resist or of ability to improve grace or the opening of the soul to the reception of grace or of the employment of grace already received, is really a breach with the gospel. 
If the soul is not merely morally sick and enfeebled, but spiritually dead, total depravity, then it follows, well, that man, since the fall, has no ability to anything spiritually good, and that in order to return to God, he needs the life-giving power of the Spirit of God, uh, that the sinner can in uh, no way prepare himself to be the subject of this grace, and he can't merit it, uh, nor can he cooperate with it, Regeneration is exclusively the work of the Spirit in which man is the subject. He's not the agent. Uh, that, therefore, uh, you know, it depends on God and not man uh, who are, uh, well, I, it's, it used to be all you would hear preached at church 400 years ago. 400. I've made a video on all these inferences are in harmony with the theology, the, the sound biblical doctrine, the theology of Paul, the lifeblood of the, the church being the 13 epistles of the New Testament. If man must work with God in any essential aspect of his own salvation, then he becomes the ultimate uh, arbiter of his own destiny. He can, he, can, he can yield and be saved or he can resist the grace of God and be lost. You know, whether his election is to be made effective or not really rests with him and not with God. And dearly beloved, the Reformers stood firmly against any such synergistic system of soteriology. They were unbendingly monergistic. A dead man cannot make himself alive. And we have to be made alive before we ever take our first breath or our first step. But in recent years, the Christian Reformed Church has witnessed uh, even the Reformed Church here in America has, has de sort of departed from this uh, resolve, this once firm resolve. Once again, the issue is the fueling that the, of, of legalism, the monergism is, is uh, sort of given, given way to synergism. It seems that persuasion you know, just would be fruitful, okay? And greater uh, eagerness in persuading men would surely turn more men toward God. I mean, surely. I mean, we got to help God out. I mean, he's just, he's, he's, God's just a little weak. But if this is not true, you know, if it, would that change the number of the elect or would it bring to the, to the birth prematurely many, uh, would it not really bring preemies into, you know, premature births into the picture? Even, you know, false births. I don't know. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't hold up, stand the, the scrutiny, test, the, stand up to, to the test of Scripture. Okay, this whole idea of, you know, well, you know, I'm, I just, you know, my, my, my loved ones, they're, I love them, they're lost, they won't accept Christ, I've been trying to get them to for years, but they just, they can't find it so sad. You know, I just, it tears me to pieces, Brother Stu, just, they just won't listen, they just, you know, they don't have a heart for the Lord, they, you ought to see some of the things they do, you, know, you wouldn't believe, you know. You know, and if I could just only get them to, and then you fill in the blank. I know this is not a word I normally use. I shouldn't probably even use on this channel, but folks, I know that sucks, all right? You've got loved ones that you want to see saved. What right do you have to say they're not? Well, because they don't look like it. They don't act like it. They don't talk like it. They don't do the same things you do because they're not at the same level of spiritual maturity as you. Keep in mind, dearly beloved, the greatest example that we were given, that is the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. But prior to his conversion on the road to Damascus, he was always a child of God. He was set apart from, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, set apart in his mother's womb to complete and fulfill the Word of God. Did he know that at the time? No, he didn't. Did he act like it at the time? No, he didn't. He didn't. 
Don't give up on your loved ones so easily, especially even given the, the shortage of time I believe that we, we have here. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope this helps in some slight way. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.